We're closing out Ecclesiastes, and we're kind of double looping because in the very first sermon on Ecclesiastes, we did the beginning and the end, the book ends. But we're coming back to the end, the conclusion of the matter in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, because of its relevant to our lives and because of its a summation to the book. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, the next three weeks we're going to be preaching on our motto, invite, include, invest, about where that comes from the biblical text and why that's what we focus upon as a church of inviting people into relationship with Jesus Christ, including them in the family of God, and helping them in their discipleship to invest their lives in kingdom building. We're going to be talking about that a little bit before we start the book of Galatians after that. This is what Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 says. The conclusion of the matter, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making of many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. This is the summation. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is evil or good. I was just thinking a little bit about this as we're talking about the wisdom of preaching. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about that and how the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, kind of sums this up. But I was thinking about words a little bit, and last night as we were getting ready for bed, Kim and I were doing our nightly routine, and she walked in the room, and I was talking to myself. In fact, I was like singing to myself like an idiot, okay, or something like that. And she said, are you talking to yourself? And I said, I quipped back, you know, I said, yeah, I'm the smartest man I know. And I said, you should listen to me more. And she said, that's why I read my Bible every single day which is her way of saying maybe you're not as wise as you think you are. We were kind of joking a little bit. But when she said that, I said, you should listen to me more because I'm wise. And she said, that's why I read my Bible every day. I thought, that is exactly the point. As we get into God's Word every single day, as we drench ourselves, as we saturate ourselves, as we deepen our relationship with Him, as He speaks to our souls, when you read your Bible, when you open it and you read it, You should think of it as Jesus in front of you speaking to your soul directly because it is God's word from him to us, and it is to speak to us. It is to address our lives. It is to change our lives. As we've talked about, it has power, and it does a variety of things in our lives. And and I think one of those things is wisdom, and wisdom that we have for everyday living. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes has been about, but it's not been about the front end of wisdom like Proverbs. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's been about the exceptions. It's about to been the dark underlining parts of life. And in this journey across the book of Ecclesiastes, we've been through a lot of the muck, the existential junk of life on this plane. And along the way, we've run into a few high points that were bright linings. It's almost like when you have a, a cloud, a real serious snowstorm, or a real serious rainstorm where you have all these huge you know, steel thunderheads come in and it covers everything and it makes everything black and you're afraid. But then the sun, right? This is Colorado. The sun pierces the darkness and gives you a ray of hope. And when the storm passes, then the sun floods it all and it's bright and better than before. And that's how the book of Ecclesiastes has been. It's been taking us on this journey through these dark things of of life without God under the sun. How is it we live when we live without God? When we make the gifts, as I've said in this world, better than the giver. When we've put the things that God's blessed us with above Jesus Christ who blessed us with those things. When we become idolaters and when we put all those things first, then what is life like? And so Solomon spent a lot of time discussing that and putting that in. It's, it's almost like his book of Confessions. How many of you ever heard of a book called Confessions by Augustine? How many of you ever heard of a book called Confessions by Augustine? It's one of the early church fathers, and this is what he says. Can, any praiseworthy, can anything be praiseworthy of the Lord's majesty or more than the Lord's majesty? How magnificent is strength, how inscrutable is wisdom. 
Man is one of your creatures, Lord, and his instinct is to praise you. He bears about him the mark of death, the sign of his own sin, to remind him that you thwart the proud. But still, since he is part of your creation, he wishes to praise you. The thought of you stirs him so deeply that he cannot be content unless he praises you, because you have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts find no peace until we find rest in you. That's how Augustine begins his confessions about his life. He goes on to talk about how for three decades he drank in sexual immorality. He drank in this world wealth and power and a lot of sexual immorality. He was the man in that part. And he did all these different things. And he tried out these different hollow philosophies. He was in northern Africa and and he tried out all the great learnings of the world and, and all these different philosophies, Stoicism and Gnosticism and all these things about how to guide his life. And he came up empty and destitute until he found Jesus Christ, which filled the hole in his soul. And so as Augustine had these confessions that drove him, his sin drove him to Jesus Christ, Solomon's done the same thing for us in his confessions, which is the book of Ecclesiastes. He confesses when he walked away from God and he did all these different things under the sun and how it was emptying, and it should drive us, that sin, that pain, that emptiness, should drive us to a dependence upon Christ. That is the whole point of the book of Ecclesiastes. And so as we come to this kind of looking at this final thing, we're going to look a little bit at what George Herbert, the, the poet, calls refining restlessness, this, this need for rest in God. And so Solomon kind of brings us back to the final measure of what we should do. And so he gives us some words to the wise. Not only was the teacher wise, verse 9, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. And the words of the wise are what? Like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd, and that should be a capital S in your Bible. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. As we come to the end of Ecclesiastes, as we close out our preaching through this book, we need to avoid a couple different mistakes, okay? The first is this, to think that the ending of the book is different than the meat of the book. And what I mean by that is some people read Ecclesiastes and they say, boy, I don't know who wrote all the beginning of this, but the dude here at the end is a different guy. Totally different thing. Or if he was writing this at one time, it's a totally different part of his life that he writes this because they don't sound like they go together. But that is erroneous. When we see that the preacher here says, not only was the teacher or the preacher wise, some people say, well, he's talking in third person. This doesn't make sense. You talk about yourself that way, right? But sometimes we do that, don't we? Sometimes we say things about ourselves in the third person or about something that we're doing, right? I mean, Jesus even did this in Matthew 12, 17 and 18. He says, he says to his disciples, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and talking about himself. He says, the Son of Man is delivered up. He's talking about himself in third person, about something that they're going to do. It's natural for people to sometimes do that. And so I don't want you to think that the person who wrote the end of this is different than the person who wrote the main person, the main meat of it. It's Solomon. It's all Solomon. He's just looking at it, remember, from the horizontal plane, and now he's back to looking at it from the vertical plane with God in the middle of it. And there's a huge difference of life like this without God and life like this with God. And so it colors the way that he looks at it, okay? The second thing that I don't want us to do is, is to think that this was an addition to the book. I actually had a man come to me and say, hey, the end of this, it doesn't match the rest, and so I think somebody wrote it later and added it. That is simply not true. This is Solomon. And it fits in well, okay? And it's just part of it. Not only was the teacher wise, but he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set things in order for the Proverbs. And the, he searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. You know, what I love about this is Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes did not hoard his wisdom. He did not hoard his wisdom. He shared it with us. And for three to 5,000 years, depends on how you date the Old Testament and those kinds of things, he's been sharing this wisdom with us and teaching us. He's been generously giving away to billions of people for the last millennia all that he has learned, right? And he does it in such a great fashion. Things that we just take for granted, like we say community. We say here community matters. Community is important. We need to connect to each other. Solomon puts it in a different way that's more artistic, in more ways that kind of hold on to us. He says, a cord of three brand, bands are not easily broken, right? 
We love that so much that we use it in weddings, sometimes even in funerals, in a variety of different settings where this artistic language, this ways that he puts things together, that that makes it more memorable, more articulate, more compelling, right? He doesn't say don't think life is about getting stuff and leaving you with the feeling the blah, 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 blah. He says life filled with all the stuff without the giver of the gifts is what? A chasing after the wind. Isn't that a great metaphor? You try to grab the wind and it just slips right through your fingers. He's using artistry. He's using his intelligence. He's using his wisdom. He's using the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to teach us in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so the words that he chooses, it says that he chooses them very carefully. He searched through them and he orders them. You can just see Solomon kind of thinking with the Holy Spirit through a thesaurus. And I'm sure it didn't work that way. But that's how I have to do it, right? When I want a different word than what I want to use in preaching, got to look at thesauruses and synonyms and all that. And Solomon's very careful, verse 10, to choose the right words, ones that are upright and true. In the ESV, it translates in verse 12 that these are words of delight, that they fill us with power, that they are morsels to our souls, that they meet deep needs, that we understand that we have emptiness when we chase life without God. And Solomon helps us to to kind of flip over the rock and see the bugs underneath. He helps us to see that that's because of our own idolatry, our own factory making of idols, right? That we are the problem, that we chase after other things instead of God. And he kind of puts that in the center, right? He kind of makes all those things there. The words of the wise, verse 11, are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd, capital S. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Genuine words of God's wisdom are this. They stabilize and they sting. You can write that down. God's general words of wisdom stabilize and they sting. That's from Mr. Levington, uh, a preacher who used those words. Brandon Levington uh, used those words in a sermon. They stabilize and they sting. And as we've read through the book of Ecclesiastes, we've seen that, right? How do they do this, right? He says, First of all, he's writing to almost like a student. He says, my son. Who is my son? My son is the collection of mankind. He is the great wise teacher speaking to his children, mankind, my son. And he's imparting his wisdom that God's given him, right? And he's putting these things together. As a good student kind of sticks to the very words of his professor and takes good notes, We need to stick to the God-given wisdom of Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs and not pursue other endless philosophies and worldly learning. God's word is sufficient. I want you to think about that, that God's word is sufficient. Now, my son, as many of you know, is at CU in the Springs, as many other people are. I know know, uh, Lizzie's on her way to DU right now with her folks. And as they go to college, they're, they're confronted with studying politics and economics and mathematics and, and all these different things, psychology and sociology and philosophy and all these different things. And those are good things that make us well-rounded. But we need to remember that the world's wisdom does not exceed God's wisdom. Amen? The world's wisdom does not exceed God's wisdom. And so we need to hold to God's words. They are life to us. They stabilize us, right? Then he says, to the end of them there's no end, to the end of much book learning, Right? My wife would say that's true. Having pursued three master's degrees, she's like, you never stop studying. You're always studying, right? We got to be careful in spending too much time on the world's wisdom and not on God's. There is an end, but the end is in the word of God that enlightens our eyes and it lightens our loads in this life. When we follow the wisdom of God that Solomon's given us, it lightens our loads. And this is what it says. It goes on to say that God's words of wisdom are sufficient because they are what? They're also from God. They are given by one shepherd, right? Traditional reading says that that given of one shepherd at the end of verse 11, that it's a capital S. Why does it say that? Because that one shepherd is Jesus Christ. How many of you know the favorite psalm, Psalms 23, right? When I visited Miss Mary in the hospital, we were quoting that together, Miss Freeman, and I said, do you remember Psalm 23? And she said, yes. And I said, I know you're not feeling good right now, but maybe we could do it together. And we quoted that together, and she remembered that just like that. And it begins that the Lord is my what? My shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. 
He meets all my needs deeply, right? As you go into Isaiah 40, 11, and Psalms 23, 1, and Psalms 81, God is called the good shepherd, right? In Ezekiel, the coming Messiah is called the shepherd in chapter 34 and 37. And then Jesus takes it in John 10, 16, and he connects those things together, and he says, I am the good shepherd. So when we're looking at God's word and the wisdom of it, how it both stings and it stabilizes, one of the ways it stabilizes is because of its wisdom. And it applies to our lives. It's sufficient to solve our issues, to meet our needs. But it stabilizes because it's from God. It's his word. And so it's living and active and powerful the way that Hebrews 4.12 says. It does all those things. So what does it do? First Timothy answers that in 3.16. It, it's good for reproof and correction and teaching and training in righteousness. And all of these things stabilize our souls as God corrects the sin out of our lives but trains us and teaches us how to be like his son Jesus, to be righteous. The reason we get into the word of God, the wisdom of God, is because of its stabilizing effect. It acts like an anchor. If you want to think about it a little bit, it acts a little bit like, um, let's use a camping metaphor. It's Labor Day weekend. It acts a lot like a tent. If you don't stake down a tent and the high winds come, what happens to that tent? Away it goes, right? <laughs> i got to go out and buy another $300 tent. But the Word of God is like those long stakes that you put in. Now, if you know anything, if you camp a lot, whatever you buy with the tent, they're always junk. You pitch those aluminum pieces of junk. You go out and you buy some expensive stakes with some claws on them and some nicks in them, and then you drive those long ones down in, and then you're good for the wind. Whatever's coming, you're good with, right? The Word of God does the same thing for us. It stakes us down to weather the things of life. The word of God, the wisdom that Solomon's given us is sufficient to meet our needs and it stabilizes us like firmly embedded nails. If you want to think of your life, you can say it as, my life is like I was afloat, a piece of driftwood afloat. But Jesus Christ came along, picked me up out of the water, since we're thinking about Hurricane Harvey, right? And he affixed me to his house. He fit me into just the right place. He shaped me. He fashioned me. And then he nailed me firmly in place to strengthen his house. That is what the word of God is like. That's what God does to our lives. It stabilizes us in that manner. It is sufficient to stabilize us and to meet the needs of our souls. But it, but it stings too, right? It says that the words of the wise are like goads at the beginning of chapter 12, verse 11. What is a goad? What, how many of you run around with goads right now? You got a goad? I would love to have a goad for my kids. You know, just a little, <laughs> little thing like that. A goad is a stick that they put a nail in the end of. They either wrapped it on, they lashed it on, or they split the stick and they embedded it in there and then tied it on. And so when you were working the sheep or the animals, when they would get out of play, when they go towards something dangerous, you'd stick them with the goad. It's kind of like a spur on a boot. And it moves the horse. They would move away from danger and move back into play of what's good. And the word of God is like something that stings us, right? From time to time, it corrects us. We start moving out of play and boom, ooh, that doesn't feel very good. God's spirit convicts us of sin and of moving out of the lifestyle we should be and of our need for Jesus and moves us back towards God. So the Word of God stabilizes and it stings, and in both ways, it is powerful in our lives. And Solomon says, listen to the wisdom of the Lord. It is exactly what we need. And why is it exactly what we need? Because Solomon's been taking us on this trip in the, to what I call the dark ascent. Like I said, darkness all the way around, but with points of light along the way. And God's Word, His wisdom, keeps us on the journey to him. It stabilizes us, it stings us, but it keeps us on the journey with God through that tough journey, right? God's word stings, it stabilizes, but it's a lot like um, Dante's Inferno. If you've ever read Dante's Inferno, all those who enter in here, it says above the gateway to hell, what's it say? All those who enter in here, what? Abandon hope. And sometimes when you read Ecclesiastes, it feels like that. But in fact, what it should say is, all those that are entering into here, the book of Ecclesiastes, should be hopeful. 
Because you know, no matter what you run into in life, no matter what we saw in the book of Ecclesiastes, God's got the answer. He gets us through it, and he sees us through to the other side. We move into the dark descent, but God's word still sees us through. We've kind of taken this, this trip that's been filled with pain and treachery and this meaninglessness, this blackness, this bleakness of life under the sun without God. But Solomon brings us back to these points where he says, with God, everything's right. It has meaning, it has purpose, it has life. It fills and it satisfies. It is the bread of life. It is the living water, walking with God. And he's spoken about these things. He's spoken about things like the brevity of our labors and our work and our very lives and how we're here for a moment and then we're gone like smoke. Remember those texts when we've looked at those? Boy, that's a lot of fun to read about. We're here today, gone tomorrow, right? But then he brings it back in full circle that with God everything's good. We've talked about the hollow halls of hedonism, how superficial and empty they are to chase money and sex and power and drugs and and different things like that and how they just don't satisfy and they don't fill. And then Solomon, after this long walk on this bleak road, brings us back around and says, but with God you can enjoy life. You can enjoy life in all your work under the sun with a wife of your youth, with your children, and with the hard work of your hands if you live with God. This dark descent was never left us there. He always brought us back, Solomon did, to these words of God that encouraged us, right? And this is what it says. Now you have heard, and this is the conclusion of the matter, this is the end, fear God and keep or obey his commandments. This is the full duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Solomon here at the end brings us right back to square one, as my father would say. He's landed us back on the beachhead of what we know to be solid biblical land that we trust and what? Obey. Have you ever heard that somewhere before? Remember that old, old great hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy with Jesus but to trust and obey? Solomon, he could just stand up and sing here that very thing, to trust and obey. The very thing that Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, the very thing that the Pauline letters teach us throughout all 13 of them, that John says in the book of Revelation, that the Old Testament saints point to is a relationship with Jesus Christ where we fear God. And we obey his commandments, right? If we have a proper relationship with God, the fear God, then we do what? We obey what he says, and he blesses us. And so Solomon brings us full circle back to that, right? But our world teaches something different. How many of you ever listen to public television or radio, NPR radio or something like that? It's kind of goofy, but every now and then I can't get another station. I have it on. I'm listening to it and stuff. And I hear a lot of this, like, human potential stuff, Wayne Dyer and, and all these different guys, and I'm not anti-Wayne Dyer or anything. I'm just saying all these guys are about human potential, how you can work to get rich and how you can do this to make yourself think, to create order in your life and to do this and do that and all these different things. And at the end, it was interesting. They were doing a fundraising campaign recently, and I was listening to it on the radio on the way to Grand Junction, and they were saying that, that the end of life was basically in themselves. And I thought, I I didn't hear that right. That that couldn't have been right. So I listened to it again, and she brought it back around. She said, we are trying to teach you to live life on your own terms. What? Solomon would have freaked out. If he was in the car with me, he would have thrown a fit, right? No, we don't live life on our own terms. That's what I've been telling you about through the whole book of Ecclesiastes. We've got to live life on God's terms. That's where the real enchilada is. That's where the big enchilada is, to, is to live in independence versus dependence, right? In, I mean, versus being on our own, doing our own thing. Independence, our dependence on God instead of our independence, right? Our obedience versus doing our own thing. And, and Solomon would say that, that we think we find freedom in God, freedom from fear, and freedom from God's limitations by doing our own thing. But instead, what we really find is that when we do our own thing, we're in slavery and bondage to the things that we're doing. That really, when we fear God and follow his commands, guess what? We live within his limitations, and that, with the fear of God, is true freedom. That we can move and play with the design of the Creator, And that we can trust and obey a God that is all-loving, all-kind, all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, working in our lives. 
And so when we trust and obey him, living within those limitations, the fear of God, right, is the beginning of wisdom, the book of Proverbs says. And Solomon says here, the fear of God and keeping his commandments is our full duty in this life. Fearing God, doing what he says. Obedience. Our freedom is in fearing God. Our obedience is in our dependence upon God, right? But what do we want? Often we want this one-two formula that Psalms has been telling us about. We, we want to be able to say an incantation. We want to be able to give a certain amount of money. We want to be able to do a certain thing, and then God makes the things that are tough in our life go away. It's not like that. It's about walking on a journey with Jesus Christ, up, down, up, down, But as the old poem about him walking on the seashore with us called Footprints says, he's with us through it all, right? That's what it's about. He's with us through it all, up, down, up, down, up, down. But you always have somebody carrying the load for you. The way Jesus said in the book of Matthew, my burden is easy and my load is light. Take my yoke upon you because my burden is easy and my load is light. You're trying to carry it on your own. You need someone strong like me, Jesus Christ, to help you with that. I'll help you carry that load. And he does that. That's what life with fearing God and obeying his commandments is, is is instead of this fast McDonald's style drive up spirituality that we're into, this consumer Christianity, this this, uh, kind of superficial, lazy spirituality where we just want a quick fix. God says, you got to stick in there with me. You got to stay in relationship with me. Fear me and keep my commandments as the full duty. And then I'm going to be there with you. That's what the Lord's saying, right? But we we choose the easy path. This morning I was getting ready for for church and I was thinking about breakfast. And this is probably not a big deal to you guys. Probably many of you eat cereal all the time, but I never eat cereal out of a box because I can't have milk. It makes me sick as a dog. So I I never have cereal. Well, I happen to have some rice milk in the house. Rice dream, rice milk, vanilla flavored. And I was thinking about what to have for breakfast. And I was thinking about, well, I know what's healthy, eggs. That's what I eat every day. But that cinnamon toast crunch cereal just looks, man, I was watching Sarah yesterday eat. I just said, mmm. So I literally opened up the pantry, reached down at the bottom, and I picked up our container of that, and I opened up the pour, and I heard Callie's voice in my head, right? Preston's wife. You know that's not good for your teeth. You know that's not good for you. And so I put the lid back on it, put it down in there, went into the fridge, grabbed the eggs, and cooked three eggs, right? But that was harder. You have to cook it. You have to prepare it. you got to season it. you got to do all that stuff. The easy path is the cinnamon toast crunch with a little bit of milk on it. In our Christianity, we want the cinnamon toast crunch. We don't want to do the harder path of preparing the eggs and cooking them, and scrambling them, and doing the work, and seasoning them. But God says the Christian walk is a journey with him, a relationship with Jesus Christ where we fear him, we respect him, and we have a healthy awe for him. And because of that, we obey him. We trust him and obey him. And that is the Christian life. That is the conclusion of the matter. And he gives us a couple reasons why. Why should we live this way? Why does it work? First of all, you don't find it in this text here, but you've seen it before. The first reason is joy. Along the way of this bleak journey through Ecclesiastes, he's given us these high points of brightness and they're points of joy. He says to enjoy God, to use the Westminster Catechism, the chief end of man is to live with God, right, to glorify him and to enjoy him forever, forever. That's how the Presbyterians have put it together, and it's purely biblical. Joy. In multiple places, he says, the, the byproduct of this is joy, okay? So in Ecclesiastes 2.10, 24, 26, 3, 12, and 13, 5, 18, 19, blah, 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 blah. There's a bunch of places. But he says in all these places that our life has meaning and purpose if we centered on Jesus Christ. And the byproduct of that, the byproduct of that is joy. And you remember what he said. He said, enjoy the wife of your youth. Enjoy the hard work of your hands. With God, enjoy your children. With God, enjoy the toil that you build and make things and all that stuff. Multiple times, he inserts joy into that. When I was studying for this, putting this together, I was thinking, 
That's amazing how much he talks about joy. Yeah, I know we're supposed to glorify God, right? In everything that we say and do, whether word or deed, bring glory to God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. But also with joy, this byproduct. And I was thinking about why does Solomon spend so much time talking about joy? Because joy is an antidote to the fear of death and to the feeling of meaninglessness. When we have joy in the Lord, what did it say in Nehemiah when we were studying that? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy is a byproduct of fearing God and obeying his commandments. Gives us this energy, gives us the strength to handle the bleakness of life. It gives us what we need to keep going. Joy in our marriages is what keeps us in the game with our lover. Joy in our child reign is what keeps us in the game as a parent. Joy is a worker. That what I'm doing has some productivity, has some point, has some meaning, keeps me in the game of serving my employer well. Joy, fear God and obey his commandments, and this byproduct of joy, where Christ fills my heart with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, out of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It is the antidote to a lot of this bleakness. And it made me think about when I was in college studying I had to take, how many of you hate those humanities classes? I hate humanities classes. They make you study all this nonsense and stuff. And, and there's this guy we read about, Albert Camus, this French existentialist. And bleh, yuck. It's all yuck, okay? But he wrote this book in 1942 that where he described life using a Greek legend of King Sisyphus, okay? And King Sisyphus in the legend, he had this huge rock that was overwhelming. And he would push this up this long street hill. And just as he got to the top, the rock would always dislodge and roll down the hill and he'd have to go back and do it again. And the gods condemned him to doing that forever. And Albert Camus, sounding a lot like the bleak parts of Ecclesiastes, said, that's life under the sun. Over and over and over and over. It's like, good grief. If you look at it like that, you'll never be okay. But Jesus inserts himself into that, and he says, I'll lift that rock with you. I'll carry that burden with you. My burden is easy, and my yoke is light because I'm the big dog that's carrying it. I'm the one doing the carrying. And then life isn't like that. And guess what? When you get to the top of the hill, the rock doesn't roll back down for the believer. I push you over the crest and you finish the task. You see the other side. So joy keeps us in the game on the tough times with Jesus keeping us going, carrying those burdens as we, we drink the joy of the pleasures of life, the gifts that God's given us, and recognize that they're from the giver. When I see the beauty of my wife, I often have to reflect upon Jesus. He made her. He created her. He gave her to me as a blessing. I don't know why, but I won't argue with him. I'm thankful. My children are a blessing from God. Not a burden, but a blessing. Yes, there's moments that feel like a burden, but they're a tremendous blessing from God that God gave these gifts to me that helped shape me with patience and and forbearance, and hopefully make me a little bit better and a little bit more like Jesus. My jobs at different times, the good and the bad, God's using those to shape me more like his son, that if I'll just fear God and follow him and obey his commands and trust him and keep on this path with Jesus, the end result will be great. It will be joyful in my life. And then he comes back in verse 14, he says, For God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. On one side, God says the side effect is joy. On the other side, God says, fear me and obey my commandments because just like I bless you with joy, I will also judge you. Five times in the New Testament it says that when we're doing our behavior, that we should consider what we say and what we do carefully because one day we will give an account to God for that. It's not about being mean or God punishing us or punking us or anything like that. Isn't it just something that we see in life? My mom used to leave and and go to the commissary and stuff when we lived near base or on base, and the five of us would be at home. And she would put my oldest brother, Charles, who's seven years older than me, in charge. And what did my mom say to him before we left, before she left? Charles, 
you're in charge. I know that's a movie, but Charles, you're in charge. But guess what? You are taking care of my stuff. So I want you to treat your brothers and your sister like I would treat them. I want you to take care of my house and make sure they take care of my house the way I would want them to do it if I was here, right? And when I come back, whether it's good or bad, guess who's called to account for that? You are because you're in charge. You're the parent in charge right now. Well, guess what? That had tempering effect, all right, because sometimes we do some crazy stuff. But when mom kind of give out the lecture, we're all sitting around going, oh, man, I can't, guess we can't do that. can't do this. Can't. Ooh, we better do the right thing. Fearing God and obeying his commandments, living by the words of wisdom from God's word that are sufficient, that both sting us, our conscience, and stabilize us in this life, walking with Christ, doing those things, it has a side effect of joy. But there's also another effect that we're called to account with what we do with that. When God gives us his word, he doesn't just give it with no accountability. He gives it to us and he explains it to us, and then he says, you're accountable for what you know. It's important that we obey God and follow his commands and trust him because we're accountable for that. And God wants to give us his grace at that time of judgment. And Jesus will be in our place and all those things, grace upon grace upon grace. But that does not mean that we're not called into account. So what's the end of the matter? As we come to the end of Ecclesiastes, the end of the matter is the whole book feels like depression that moves us towards dependence. I was trying to think, how do I sum that up in a sentence? You go through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I've said, at times it feels like I'm preaching gargling gravel. And sometimes it's probably been worse for you to listen to it. I'm sorry. It's tough. It's tough stuff. But in the midst of the toughness, in the midst of the bleakness, in the midst of the depression sounding, there is great wisdom from God's word for us to live at the end of the day a life of dependence upon God through Jesus Christ. If we had to sum it up, the book of Ecclesiastes, it's about us living life under the sun with the Son, capital S-O-N, Jesus Christ. That's what life is all about. If you ever spoke to a mature believer that has lived a long time, and they will talk about walking with Christ for decades, and if you will be patient sometime and sit with one of the senior saints and listen to what God's done in their lives over 40, 50, 60, 70 years, it is a tremendous blessing. It is a tremendous blessing because you get to hear these stories of how God has, has shepherded them through a variety of difficulties, some of the worst things you can imagine, and how those things you think, I couldn't survive that. And they would say, yes, you can because God helped me to survive it too. I thought the exact same thing when I was on the front end of that. But on the backside, looking back, I can see how obeying God and following him made all the difference in the world. Trusting and obeying him was all the difference in the world. And if you'll sit with those senior saints, a lot of times they give you that wisdom of, you know what, when I'm going through what I'm going through, you know what I need to do? When I feel like quitting, I need to do what? I need to just push through holding Jesus' hand. Just continue to trust and obey him because he's going to see me through just like he's seen so many millions before me through. The way he got Joseph through the selling into slavery and into the jail and back up to the top with Pharaoh, Jesus can do that with me. The way that he got David through, Saul trying to kill him, on the run in the desert, almost wiped out, but then God brings down Saul and brings up David. God's all about the miraculous, right? The way that he took one and a half million of his children, the children of Israel, through the Red Sea literally on dry land, walking through the Red Sea, but then drowned the Egyptian army behind them. He can do great things in their lives. Book of Hebrews says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That same God is working on my behalf. So when Solomon says to me, the end of the matter is this, Fear God and obey his commandments. Hold to his word that's, that stings like goads, but is strengthening you like firmly embedded nails. Hold the course. That's good wisdom for living 
for you and I today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. Sometimes Ecclesiastes reads as a very odd book. Sometimes it, it just has a strange feel. But it's still your word. It's still empowered by your spirit. It's still inspired by your spirit through the person of Solomon. Father God, may we, we take certain things away. This big idea of joy that we need to live our lives, that we need to enjoy the gifts of God and worship God for them and drink them in, not loving them more than the giver, but loving the giver for the gifts. And Father, may we understand that at the end of the day, we all have a judgment for what we do in the body, good or bad, and that we all need Jesus Christ, that the only thing that will be good enough in God's eyes is not the work that I do or religion or anything like that. The only thing that will make me pass the judgment of God is the finished work and life of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ was my substitute in my place, bearing my penalty for my sin on the cross, and that he drank it in, the wrath of the God, and that his perfect life, who never sinned in what he said or did, that he gives that life, that righteousness on my behalf. That there's this great exchange that if I come to him and I say, Jesus, I believe in you. I have faith in you. I trust you. I trust that what you've done on my behalf is going to be applied to me. Jesus, I give my life to you and I trust that you're going to save me from my sin. That when we do those things, that God gives us his righteousness. And that he starts to work in our lives by the Holy Spirit working in our souls.